everyone. In this lecture, we will discuss medications used for intubation, as well as those used for sedation once your patient has been intubated. This is a brief overview. This is not a comprehensive list of medications or a complete discussion of this complicated topic. We encourage you to familiarize yourself with the medications that you have available in more detail. I'm here with Dr. Peter Acker, who will help me discuss these topics. Welcome, Peter. Thank you. Intubation is a painful procedure in a patient who is already having a lot of anxiety and discomfort about not being able to breathe. Patients need good sedation and they need good amnesia so they don't remember this procedure. Once you have sedated the patient adequately, paralyzing the patient can make intubation a lot easier to see the vocal cords since the patient isn't gagging or reacting to pain and moving. It is very important to never paralyze someone without sedating them first. This scenario can be very terrifying for your patient. There are several options for sedation with intubation. Ideally, you want something that works very fast and has few side effects. These should be given prior to any paralytics and are given as an IV bolus of medication. Atominate is a common sedative used for rapid sequence intubation. Atominate has very few cardiovascular side effects and works fairly quickly. Its onset can be as fast as 15 to 45 seconds and can last three to 12 minutes. Another option is midazolam a fast-acting benzodiazepine with an onset of 30 to 60 seconds and can last 15 to 30 minutes. It can cause hypotension and respiratory depression, so use this medication with caution. Propofol can be used as well. Keep in mind that this can cause dose-dependent hypotension and respiratory depression. It has a fast onset of 15 to 45 seconds and has a duration of action of 5 to 10 minutes. Ketamine also works fairly quickly with the onset of action of 45 to 60 seconds and lasting 10 to 20 minutes. Ketamine has the advantage of preserving a patient's respiratory drive, so they can be intubated while still breathing. You can see an increase in heart rate and blood pressure from sympathetic stimulation. The two main categories of medications are depolarizing and non-depolarizing medications. This describes what happens at the neuromuscular junction. Depolarizing agents will cause just that, depolarization. This can cause an elevation of potassium of up to 0.5 milliequivalents per liter. For this reason, remember to not use succinyl choline on any patients that you, in whom you are concerned about their potassium levels, such as crush or burn injuries after 72 hours, anyone with a nervous system injury or disease that may cause upregulation of acetylcholine receptors, such as strokes after a few days, progressive neurologic diseases, and anyone with a family history of malignant hyperthermia. Succinylcholine, a depolarizing agent, has a rapid onset of 45 to 60 seconds with a duration of action of six to 10 minutes. Brachyronium is a non-depolarizing agent, so it won't affect your potassium, and it has a fast acting onset of approximately 45 to 60 seconds and has a duration of action of 45 minutes. You have now intubated your patient and it is time to sedate them. Let's talk about the goals of sedation. We talked about how intubation is a very painful and scary procedure. The tube itself can be painful. The pressure of air being pushed in the lungs can also be very uncomfortable. If patients are uncomfortable, they may reach and pull at the tubes and lines you have placed. We need the patients to relax, not feel discomfort or remember what's happening, and not fight the air being pushed into their lungs by the ventilator. So the goals of sedation are to provide anxiolysis, amnesia, and analgesia so patients can tolerate the intubation itself and other painful procedures that they might need. How much sedation do we want to use? When we initiate sedation, we want to start at a dose that allows for complete comfort. But gradually, you want to lower the dose so that you have the minimum amount of sedation that you need. Over-sedation can lead to delirium, a common problem seen in intubated patients. Studies show higher doses of medications can prolong the duration of intubation. There are also medication side effects. We want to be able to assess for the success of extubation, so keeping sedation light will allow us to do this. Here are some common sedation medications that are used given as a continuous IV infusion. Keep in mind there are many medications that can be used, and you should become familiar with the dosing and side effects of what you have available in order to become proficient in their use. Let's review these medications. We talked about propofol as a sedation agent for intubation. It can also be used for sedation after intubation as a continuous IV infusion. It does not have any analgesic properties, so often is used in conjunction with pain medication. It is very short acting and can easily be titrated up or down. 
It can cause hypotension and bradycardia that is dose dependent. And a serious side effect is propofol infusion syndrome, a rare condition of dysrhythmias, metabolic acidosis, rhabdomyolysis, and hyperlipidemia. Midazolam and lorazepam are short-acting benzodiazepines that can also be used for sedation. These also are often used in conjunction with analgesia. Benzodiazepines can cause hypotension. Prolonged use is associated with ICU delirium. Midazolam does have active metabolites and can cause prolonged sedation, especially in the elderly or those with kidney or liver problems. Lorazepam is lipophilic, and you can have buildup in tissues that can cause prolonged sedation. Dexmedetomidine is a short-acting alpha-2 agonist often used in conjunction with analgesia. It inhibits the release of norepinephrine, terminating propagation of pain signals. Usually, patients are easily arousable as it does not affect a patient's respiratory drive. It has minimal amnestic properties. Remember, it can also cause hypotension and bradycardia. Ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. The advantage of it is that it maintains a patient's respiratory drive and cardiac output. It also provides both analgesia and amnesia. It does cause sympathetic stimulation, so you can see an increase in heart rate and blood pressure. You can also see an emergence reaction once the medication has been stopped. Here, you can review usual doses of these medications. There can be variations on administration. For example, some practitioners do give small boluses of propofol to help with additional sedation if needed. It is best to review these doses with a more thorough reference. Finally, we will talk about analgesia. Remember that of the sedation medications that we have talked about, only ketamine provides pain control. So you may need to supplement your sedation with medication to treat the pain associated with intubation. This can also reduce the total amount of sedative medication needed. Fentanyl is a short-acting opiate. It is easily titratable. It can cause hypotension, but much less than other opiates due to minimal histamine release with this medication. It can also accumulate in adipose tissue and cause chest wall rigidity. Longer acting opiates such as morphine and hydromorphone can be used However, these can cause more hypertension as well as accumulate in patients with renal and hepatic dysfunction. You may give a loading dose if needed and titrate to effect. In summary, when intubating, always sedate a patient before paralyzing them. Use information available for each patient individually to decide what medication is best for that patient. When sedating a patient after intubation, ensure that the patient is comfortable while using the minimal amount of sedation needed. Learn what medications are available for you to use. Thank you for joining us.